Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh, your host of the talk show and podcast here in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I am talking with Japan Times writer and wolf enthusiast, Alex KT Martin. Thank you so much for joining, Alex. Good morning, Joy. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure um, to talk about the wolf, my one of my uh, uh, biggest hobbies. Thanks. Oh, it's amazing. You've mm -hmm. done so many interesting articles and looking into the history and the folklore and the conservation aspects as well as talking to so many interesting stakeholders and players in the whole discussion about the wolf is really fascinating. How Thank did you, you first you. get started? Was it around 2019 when you wrote that first article? That's correct. Um, it was, I wasn't actually researching about the Japanese wolf or anything uh, about it. Um, it sort of happened upon me. Uh, my mother has a uh, mountain cabin up in uh, Chichibu, which is the, uh, the western edge of Saitama Prefecture. It's about maybe uh, two hours from Tokyo um, by train and car. Anyway, um, one of her neighbors, uh, a lady called uh, Rina Kambayashi, uh, one day called her up. This was in December 2018. She called my mother up and said, uh, uh, Takayama-san, that's my mother's uh, uh, last name, Takayama-san, I think I saw a wolf uh, in, in my garden. And my mom was like, uh, well, I think the wolf in Japan at least uh, has been extinct for quite a while, um, in fact, over a century. Um, so she laughed it off. And then she uh, told me that story uh, several months later in early 2019. And something just sort of uh, rang a bell, and I started uh, Googling the Japanese wolf and soon realized that it's been uh, gone since 1905. But then I also realized that Chibu has been a, a center of wolf worship in Japan for quite a long time. So I sort of connected the dots and uh, started uh, some, some researching. And then I realized that there's uh, people actually uh, searching for uh, the actual uh, living Japanese wolf in this area. And I, uh, I found that very fascinating. So. Uh, I reached out to uh, uh, a guy called uh, a certain Mr. Yagi, uh, Hiroshi Yagi, who's been uh, leading the search for over, over half a century now. And that's where the, uh, the sort of the story began. It's and really I, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I heard in your really, really great podcast on Japan Kill with Tony uh, talking about you going back to the house, talking to people who had that first sighting and then really started, it kind of piqued your interest in going back and rediscovering a lot of the stories and history and folklore from that area. Is that right? That's correct. So what I did was I uh, dropped an email to uh, Hiroshi Yagi. Um, I explained the situation, telling him that uh, my mother's friend uh, claims that she saw a wolf uh, in her garden. Um, what do you think? And he responded and said, like, let's go and check it out. So I met him up at uh, Seibu Chichibu Station. This was, I think, either in March or April 2019. And he, uh, I hopped on his van and we went over to Rina Kambayashi's house. It's a really old Japanese style, uh, uh, old big house with a pretty nice garden. And there's like an empty pond that's no longer in use. And uh, Rina-san came out and sort of showed us where the, the wolf or the dog or the, uh, the mysterious animal was standing. And Yagi-san began sort of interviewing uh, her, uh, asking her about uh, the height of the dog, the color of the uh, the, the fur, how the uh, the tail uh, looked like, et cetera, et cetera. And then he concluded that, you know, um, well, there's no uh, indication that this couldn't be a wolf. <laughs> That's the way he put it, I think. Um, and that was it in terms of that particular story. But then the, the whole sort of uh, uh, the sequence of events really fascinated me. You know, here I am, you know, up in the mountains of Chichibu and I'm with this man who's been searching for an extinct animal for 50 years. And here, and then another lady who says she just saw one a few months before. I was like, okay, this is definitely a story. Um, and I haven't read something like that uh, anywhere else. Um, then I started researching and I, I realized that there was actually, you know, uh, plenty of Japanese books that's been published in the past by a wolf enthusiast, uh, you know, looking for the Japanese wolf, um, but not much in English literature. Um, so I started doing some research and going around the other, there's, a, there's about maybe, maybe uh, 20 or so shrines in the Chichibu area that's dedicated to the Japanese wolf. Um, so I started going around each of them. Um, the most famous being uh, Mitsumine Shrine, uh, way up in the mountains. Um, it's a very it's a gigantic shrine, actually, and there's about uh, many, many wolf statues dotting the premises. Um, and they have these uh, wolf ofuda talismans. This one in particular isn't from Mitsumine. This is from uh, this is from Hodo-san. 
it's another major sort of wolf shooting cry in uh, Cebu. Anyway, I started collecting these uh, talismans. This is from uh, uh, this is from uh, Musashi Mitake Shrine. This is not in Cebu. This is uh, this is in the uh, the Okutama area from uh, Ome, I think. Anyway, I started doing some research and really got fascinated into the whole thing. Um, because it sort of incorporates various aspects. Um, there's obviously the, the the history and the folklore and the religion. Um, then there's the environmental aspect. Why did the Japanese school go extinct in the first place in 1905? Then there's the search. There's the cryptozoological sort of aspect that you know um, sort of borders on you know sort of shady stuff. But but then again, the wolf was actually you know it, it existed in the past. So it's not like uh, we're looking for uh, Nessie, for example. Um, so all that combined, I uh, wrote a story, a feature story, maybe about 2,500 words, and published that in May 2019. And I thought I was sort of finished with the uh, the whole uh, story, but uh, then you know I just couldn't stop researching. I went on and on and on, and uh, then last year I published this five part series. I'm showing here one of your articles uh, from 2019. Uh, talking with Yagi-san, who mm -hmm. himself had taken pictures of what he thought might be the wolf. Um, and then there was a lot of debate about that as well. Was it a wild dog? Was it a real Japanese wolf? Was it a hybrid? Really interesting. Yes. Um, so what Yagi-san's been doing for at least the past 20 uh 20 or 20, 30, 30 years or so, is uh, he's been setting up these trail cameras um, up in the mountains of Chichibu. He also runs a blog um, where he gets a lot of uh, mail um, from uh, people across Japan uh, who claims who claiming to see uh, animals resembling the Japanese wolf. So he sort of picks up that data. He actually goes to the field and he uh, picks up on locations where uh, people claim to have seen these uh, wolves and he sets up trail cameras in these areas. And at this point, he has about 70 set up in the Chichibu region. Um, he concentrates in the Chichibu region because that's one area where there's a, been a lot of uh, uh, reported sightings. But uh, he could expand all over Japan if he wanted to, but uh, it's pretty much a one-man team. He runs an NPO, but there's maybe like seven people uh, working with him. So uh, he can't sort of you know go to, for, for example, Hiroshima, where you live, um, or you know other areas in Japan, just because of, it's just too much for, for a, a certain individual. Anyway. Um, so he's been doing that for a while. And the big discovery he made was back in 1996. This was October 14th. And uh, he was driving in this mountain road up in Chichibu. And uh, he came upon this strange looking animal um, sort of crossing the street in front of him. And he was looking at it and he realized that, you know, oh my God, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is the animal I've been looking for uh, since he was 20 or so. And by the, this time, he was about 46 years old, I think. So he got out of the, the car and he took out his camera from the trunk and he took 19 photographs of this animal, um, which resembled, um, it's, as you can see, it's, it looks like it could be a wild dog. It looks like a wolf. It's sort of hard to tell what it is. So he took it to uh, various academics to sort of uh, get it evaluated. Um, most said, you know, you can't really tell just from the you know, photographs you need to, you need the actual specimen in front of you to make an analysis. But one of the first people uh, who um, said this could be a Japanese wolf was uh, uh, Mr. Imaizumi, um, who was a very renowned zoologist at the time. He already passed away. But he uh, sent an, a letter to Yagi saying that, you know, there's, there's a very high chance that this is the actual extinct animal. So uh, go for it and go go search for it. So Yagi was, re you know, he was really invigorated. And uh, he went on, he started setting up these trail cameras all over the place. And he still does that. Um, although, however, he hasn't been able to actually capture the animal in uh, on video really clearly at this point yet. It's so interesting. So he's a he's so active and he's got a group. He's looking for funding. Uh, really interesting in in your talks with him, um, mm -hmm. how he he's saying he wants to capture one alive so that they can do MRIs on the skeleton and really discover. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, people who theorize that there's probably a hybrid uh, between the wild dogs in Japan and the wolves, uh, which might be what people are seeing now in Japan. But there's been a few sightings that you've documented, right? Yes, um, there's been. Well, to begin with, so back in 1905, why... Uh, why well, that's the date that's considered to be uh, the date when the Japanese wolf went extinct was because uh, that was when the, the last uh, animal specimen 
was discovered by uh, this American explorer called uh, Malcolm Playfair Anderson. So he was uh, commissioned to uh, travel uh, in Japan and in Asia to uh, sort of search for exo exotic animal specimens. And he was in, uh, in Nara Prefecture um, in the village of Higashi Yoshino when uh, some hunters brought in a carcass of a wolf. And he, uh, I think he instinctively knew that, you know, this was something really rare. So he uh, somehow managed to uh, procure the funding and gave, paid the uh, the hunters uh, eight yen and 50 sen, which is about, how much is that? Uh, I can't, it's it's like Niju Mayan or something, I guess, perhaps in the current. Uh, the, I, saw, uh, <laughs> I saw in your article that mm -hmm. he, he was like debating about paying 10 yen, which would be like 200,000 yen in modern mm -hmm. times or something. And then they left, like right. doing the, the hard sell, right? Mm -hmm. And then they came back and he bought it for 8 yen, which would be like 120,000 or something. Right. But he, he realized how rare and special it was that mm -hmm. he, he really wanted to have mm -hmm. a sample. And it was eventually sent on to London. It's in the Natural History Museum. Is that right? That's correct. It's still there, actually. Um, and that's considered the last wolf specimen um, to ever been discovered. Uh, still, um, when I was in Shibu talking to various people, um, I realized that there's probably a high possibility that the wolf didn't go extinct on that precise date. I, I would assume, I think it was pr probably around until maybe the 1930s or so, at least. Um, uh, the, Due to the interviews that I've conducted, there's been people who claim, you know, hunters claim that they've, you know, seen wolves back in those days. So, in, in either case, are the wolves still around in 2020? That's a different question. But then I go back to the introduction of my first uh, story in the series, where uh, uh, a British man, uh, Michael Burke, um, he uh, was driving one day. Uh, this was uh, near Karuizawa, I think, and uh, he and his wife uh, came upon a, a mysterious animal didn't look like a fox, sort of looked like a Shiba, but it was wild. Um, and uh, he contacted me and said that, you know, this doesn't look like uh, a regular dog or a fox. You know, it looks like the uh, the taxidermied specimens of the Japanese wolf you see online. So um, sightings like these uh, still continue. Um, Yagi gets uh, plenty of uh, emails from people claiming they've seen these animals. Um, and back to uh, your question of, you know, is it, the actual Japanese wolf, or are these hybrids? Um, it's a difficult question. Uh, we know that there's been wolf-dog hybrids in the past, and uh, this is sort of this is the science scientific part that's going to be a little bit complicated to explain. Um, well, if you so, if you go mm -hmm. back to one of the historical figures that you mm -hmm. talk about. Mm -hmm. um, this Edo right. era painting of mm -hmm. uh, Seibold. Now, Seibold mm -hmm. was thought to be a spy and mm -hmm. had to leave the country in disgrace, right? He was in Dejima in Nagasaki. Um, that whole part was really fascinating how he was comparing what was told to him is a wild dog and a wolf. And that first comparison, and now his sample is, I think, is in the Netherlands, right? That's correct. So when Seibold was in, uh, I think he was traveling through Osaka um, in Tennoji, he bought two uh, canine uh, specimens. One, he was sold, the person who sold the animal said one was an okami, a wolf, and the other was a yamainu, which is translates to mountain dog. But the thing is, back in the days, there wasn't a very a strong distinction between an okami and a yama inu. These words were pretty interchangeable. And depending on which region you go to Japan, um, people would call them, you know, an oinu or a yama inu or okame. And there's been various sort of names attached to these mountain wolves or dogs. So anyway, he had these two specimens and he had them sent over to uh, the Netherlands, um, to Leiden, uh, where there's a big natural history museum. Um, and But the person in charge back then, um, a certain Mr. Temink, he sort of, uh, despite these two animals being labeled separately, he sort of chunked them together and uh, named, conjointly named, named them the, the Japanese wolf or uh, Canis uh, hodophylax. And that's the root of the problem. Um, today, there's, strangely, there's three specimens in Leiden, not just the wolf and the Yamainu, but then another sort of uh, skull set. And for the longest time, uh, this has been really confusing researchers because these specimens are considered the type specimen, which is used to sort of distinguish other animals. When, for example, if you find a, uh, a suspect 
Japanese wolf uh, skull somewhere in the mountains. You would take that and compare that with the specimen in Leiden to make a match. And this was before DNA uh, research and everything really took off, right? So for the longest time, researchers would use these specimens that Seibold collected to prove whether uh, another specimen is that of a Japanese wolf or not. But modern day research finally, you know, uh, a certain Mr. Ishiguro, um, uh, Professor Ishiguro uh, from Gifu University, he acquired the uh, DNA samples from all three specimens and he conducted a, a mitochondrial uh, DNA test. And what he discovered was uh, specimen B, which uh, Seibold labeled the Okami, was uh, matches all other Japanese wolf uh, DNA samples, meaning it's probably a Japanese wolf. Specimen C, was also a Japanese wolf. Um, however, uh, it's, it has clear differences compared to specimen B. It's, uh, it's much smaller. Um, the, the skeletal sort of uh, figure is different. Plus the uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA test, it tests the, uh, the, it tests the mother line ancestry of animals, which indicates that the father of specimen C, the Yama Inu, could have been a, a dog, like a hybrid, um, going back to what you mentioned before which could indicate that um, there's been hybrids between the J-Wolf and dogs um, for, for quite a while back in the days. Um, and perhaps um, even after the Japanese wolf's official extinction date, there, may, there might be dogs or wolf or wolf-dog hybrids out there that has traces of Japanese wolf DNA inside them. Are, is the actual Japanese wolf still out there? We don't know. Uh, maybe Yagi-san will find out one day, uh, and I'm hoping so. But at this point, it's uh, I think one thing we should be looking out for is uh, traces of Japanese wolf DNA in wild dogs in Japan. So interesting. I, mm -hmm. I find that so fascinating. And you've talked to so many scientists and researchers who are testing the DNA, as well as hunters and researchers going into the forest. Um, you've got information from all over. It's really interesting. Let's talk about numbers for a minute. At mm -hmm. one point, you talk about the total numbers of the wolf types, the Hokkaido type, um, maybe had between 2,000 and 5,000 of this type, and the Honshu type uh, was more prevalent, 5,000 or more. Is that right? Right. And these figures are, are it's, it, it really depends on who you talk to. Um, that particular figure, I think I got from uh, Professor Maruyama, who heads the Japan Wolf uh, Organization. This is a group that's uh, trying to reintroduce wolves uh, into Japan. Um, I think he, he claimed that, you know, uh, according to his estimates, there was maybe like 5,000 to 10,000 Japanese wolves uh, in Honshu, Shikoku, and uh, Kyushu uh, back in the days, and maybe two, 3,000 uh, Hokkaido wolves, Sezo wolves in Hokkaido. Um, but I don't think there's been any uh, sort of comprehensive research that uh, gives a precise number of uh, uh, the wolves back then. I think one reason is because uh, back in the days, there wasn't too much interest, a scientific interest in preserving uh, these specimens. Um, it was only in modern times that this animal has been sort of named a Japanese wolf and recognized as a Japanese wolf. So, uh, you know, back in the days, plus, you know, wolves are very, uh, they're very vigilant. They don't, they try to keep away from humans to start with. So very, they're very uh, quite a mysterious animal to start with. So I think it's been really hard to sort of pinpoint, you know, how many of them resided here, there, or you know, anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's just a rough guess. Yeah. You know? Let's talk about the character of the wolf, and it it might have been a misinterpretation of a wild dog versus a wolf, which might have been the reason they were exterminated and poisoned in the beginning, um, because wild dogs are more likely to attack humans, whereas like you said, the wolf is more likely to hang back and not, not really attack people. But it was another American who was a rancher mm -hmm. uh, that you cite, as the reason a lot of wolves were killed and poisoned because the wolves were attacking their horses. Is that right? Right. Um, I think that's uh, Mr. Edwin, uh, Edwin Dunn, was it? <laughs> so many yeah, people. You have, you have some great names. Like we, I have to mention how much I love uh, the 1905 Explorer's middle name. Who mm -hmm. uses the middle name Playfair? I think we should bring that back. It's fantastic. Um, but right. yeah, another American who was mm -hmm. a rancher in Japan, um, you cite as someone who maybe right. 
is the reason we don't have wolves in Japan anymore, right? Well, this is just in Hokkaido, actually. Uh, Mr. Edwin Dunn, he was a rancher. Oh, well, he introduced ranching into Hokkaido, I think. Um, I'm not too much of an expert about uh, uh, Hokkaido wolves, but anyway, um, uh, the Hokkaido wolves, uh, they're much bigger than the Japanese wolves in terms of uh, physique. Um, they're much closer to the continental gray wolves in terms of uh, their looks. And um, they, they, you know, they used to prey on the, Ezo, the Yezojika deer. That, that's been their, you know, the big prey that they would go after. Um, but there's been some really heavy winters uh, back in the days um, where they couldn't get enough deer and they started uh, uh, hunting on uh, uh, cows and other sort of uh, animals uh, that uh, the ranchers had. And that uh, triggered um, a massive, uh, uh, basically poisoning these, these wolves to death. Um, this is the situation in Hokkaido. And that led to their uh, presumed extermination um, in the uh, late uh, 19th century. Um, in Japan, well, in, 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 the, in the Honshu area where the Japanese wolf reside, a similar situation, but more of a combination of uh, various aspects, I think. Um, uh, similar to the Hokkaido wolf, um, the Japanese wolf, according to uh, past historical records, um, they began preying on horses um, uh, and other cattle uh, back during the, uh, the early Edo period, which led to sort of bounties uh, being put on them. So anyone who would uh, kill a Japanese wolf can take it to their local authorities and get, uh, you know, one yen or uh, how many sen, pretty high price from back in the days. So, um, so they were gradually, their population gradually changed. And one theory is that, you know, um, as you mentioned before, uh, were, were these really Japanese wolves that's who were preying on these cattle or were they uh, wolf dog hybrids? Um, this, this theory um, comes because of uh, this well, at least to some of the zoologists I talked to, they mentioned that uh, uh, when when a wolf and a dog mates and creates a hybrid, they sort of uh, they get the traits of both wolves and dogs, obviously. And depending on the combination, it could be quite dangerous. They can be as friendly as dogs, but as sort of, uh, what do you call, um, as, uh, I, don't, I don't want to use the word vicious, but uh, <laughs> what do you call, uh, they, they have they have the instincts of the wolves, but the friendliness of the dogs, which could be dangerous when, when combined in a certain situation. And some people sort of theorize that perhaps these wolf-dog hybrids were responsible for these uh, uh, cattle damage back in the days, which led to the, the humans sort of uh, fighting back uh, and leading to the gradual extermination. Um, but these are all theories, and I don't think uh, they've been verified 100% uh, to date. Yeah, it's so interesting, though. I want to talk about the conservation aspect a little bit because you've touched on it a few times. Mm -hmm. So I, it really reminds reading about the conservation side of bringing back the wolves and that argument um, to keep nature in better balance really reminds me of when I was talking with Marik about uh, the conservation of sharks in, in the seas and how we need the predator in the natural environment to keep things in balance. And there is a really good argument in Japan to bring the wolves back to keep the herbivores who are now causing so much damage to the forests and to the farms in better balance. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, and that goes back to the, uh, the Japan uh, wolf organization um, headed by... Uh, Mariyama-san. <clears throat> right, so um, I, I have a couple of trail cameras set up in uh, Chichibu uh, near my uh, uh, weekend home. And uh, whenever I retrieve the data cards and when I open it, you see it's just deer everywhere, um, every night. <laughs> you, can, you can hear them sort of screaming, you know, when you spend nights there. And they're everywhere, like uh, packs and families of deer walking around. And the damage they're inflicting um, in terms of like ripping off barks and eating undergrowth is uh, it's, it's quite it's it's quite enormous. Um, and there have been there's been various uh, programs uh, being introduced to sort of prevent uh, deer and other sort of animals from uh, sort of hurting farmland and forests, um, like the electrified fences, for example. Um, there's the uh, the monster wolf, which is like a wolf. <laughs> it's like a robot with a with, with wolf skin sort of barking and making gunshot sounds, yes, um, and things like that. But uh, the problem is uh, we just don't have enough hunters. Um, uh, the, I think the average age of hunters right now is in their 60s or 70s. They're getting quite old. 
um, and it's very hard to sort of recruit uh, younger ones. Although there are there there are people, uh, younger folks who are interested in hunting, but I just the, the numbers just don't really match. Yeah. So one way every, to sort of <laughs> every rural area that I go into, they always talk about this, and every mm -hmm. organic farmer I talk to mm -hmm. talks about this, right? Like mm -hmm. the monkeys are wreaking havoc on Chuck Kayser's organic farm in Shiga. Mm -hmm. um, the boars are wreaking havoc on organic farms in Hiroshima. It, mm -hmm. it is a nationwide problem. And yeah. your interviews with hunters is really interesting. And also when I talk to people in rural areas like mm -hmm. Tokushima, they talk about how you can get 50,000 yen if you catch a monkey. Like mm -hmm. there's certain wow. uh, deer or monkey or boars who mm -hmm. are targeted because they're causing so much damage. In your article, you talk about 15.8 billion yen mm -hmm. in 2019 is attributed to damage from these, mm -hmm. these pests who've become too prevalent, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's correct. And so what can we do? And one idea is to reintroduce wolves. Um, I would assume uh, gray wolves from either Canada or uh, um, or China or somewhere else, sort of let them sort of out into the wild, <laughs> into the Japanese wilderness, and hope that uh, they would start hunting down on these beasts uh, or um, pests. Um, it's been an idea that's been going around for quite a while, uh, mainly promoted by uh, Mr. Naoki Maruyama of the Japan Wolf Organization. Um, he's really been promoting this uh, passionately for uh, a few decades now. Um, however, there's a strong resentment about among people in general, the general public, about the idea of having wolves back in, in our forests. Um, I think it's sort of understandable um, if you, if you, it's been over a century since wolves are around, and uh, suddenly having them back in the mountains, um, I could easily sort of uh, imagine people getting scared. <laughs> um, in fact, he told me that uh, this is about 20 years ago. Um, he was supposed to give a speech in, uh, up in Nikko in Tochigi Prefecture about uh, the importance of reintroducing wolves. And I think the local newspaper ran a small segment saying Mr. Nariyama is coming to so-and-so uh, Kaikan to do a speech. Then he got a call um, in the morning that he was about to leave his home from a, from a mother saying that, you know, are you crazy? You know releasing wolves when what if my son gets uh, eaten while he was uh, going to school and then once he arrived at the venue uh, there were these uh, uyoku right-wing sand trucks sort of surrounding the venue and saying that you know why are you trying to reintroduce foreign wolves when we used to have our own japanese wolf that's two different sort of uh, concepts sort of like <laughs> uh, colliding there um you know once nationalism once just pure sort of uh, fear but anyway there's various aspects that's uh it's making it difficult for this idea to really take off. Um, the other problem perhaps would be that the Japanese wolf was one of the smallest wolves in the world, um, if not the smallest. I think there's another uh, species that's smaller than the Japanese. Anyway, it's really small uh, compared to uh, uh, the wolf that you would imagine roaming uh, in the United States or Canada, for example. Um, so if we were to import wolves, um, that difference in physique uh, could be one issue um, because, uh, let, you know, you can imagine if a, a pretty big wolf is released in the forest and um, starts hunting down uh, shika or monkeys or whatever. Um, can, compared to the, the Japanese wolf's size, they're perhaps maybe a 1.5 or twice the size. You know, what, what, what does that mean? Is that going to really restore the balance or is that going to go overboard? And that's another debate. Mariyama san says that, you know, after a few generations, the, the size of uh, uh, a gray wolf, an imported gray wolf, will probably adapt to the Japanese uh, landscape and grow smaller. But that is sort of, sort of a hypothesis. Um, and uh, I think at this point, people are just scared of, of having them back. Another issue, perhaps, is uh, if it's like Yellowstone, where you know there's like a vast sort of spread of land and you can let the wolves uh, roam as they want to. Um, that could be uh, okay, but uh, in Japan, um, as you know, the distance between the mountains and where we live is very close. Um, I mean, 70% of the, the land mass is, is mountains, and then we sort of live so, you know, right next to it. So yeah. there's the distance is You're, so close that... You that, also had a mm -hmm. great uh, interview with Suruda-san, Kumiyumiko Suruda, who manages uh, trying to get mm -hmm. forests, like healthier forests, to mm -hmm. be to be done, um, maintained better in Japan. And one of her arguments is uh, we need to improve the forest before we are worthy 
of the Japan wolf to come back. That, that now the forests have too much cedar. They're mm -hmm. not a natural diverse forest that mm -hmm. the wolf and other animals need mm -hmm. to thrive. And I thought that was a really interesting argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So that's that, that goes to sort of the environmental aspect, I think. Um, so if you go to the Japanese countryside, I think you'll notice um, a lot of the forests are evergreens, um, mostly uh, cedar and cypress trees, sugi and uh, hinoki. Um, and the reason behind that was because there was a major drive um, during World War II to sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, cut down forests and replant them with the, these fast growing conifers uh, to sort of uh, help with uh, sort of housing demand and um, various other sort of energy needs. So, you know, vast swaths of Japan's forests were cut down um, and replanted and at this point, I think there's maybe like 40% of uh, trees in Japan are artific artificially planted. The problem is, you know, if they're pruned and if they're sort of taken care of, it's okay. But uh, cheap imports began coming into Japan, which meant that uh, sort of domestically grown trees, they're, uh, um, they became more expensive than these cheaper imports. So the, they've gradually became left un unattended. So what you see in the countryside are these really skinny um, sugi trees sort of packed together really and you know uh, dark forests right um, you go in there and you don't get any sunlight it's very unhealthy forests um and it's been a bit major issue for quite some time um and sort of confounding that problem is that uh, it's the same with the hunters but uh, the number of uh, people um, working in forestry has, has also been dwindling in japan so it's uh, it's a situation that's that's there um it's uh, it and what 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 happens when you have so many sort of dense, stark forests of uh, these sugi and hinoki trees is that uh, it limits undergrowth, which limits the number, uh, you know, the food for herbivores. At the same time, it releases, you know, a lot of kafun pollen, right? So kafun sho um, is, uh, is uh, hay fever is a huge thing in Japan. And I think I read the news this morning that this year it's going to be like 1.5 times a, a regular season. So, um, you know, it causes various problems and it also, in terms of the Japanese wolf's uh, uh, survival, um, it's the forest atmosphere or the environment is drastically different from what it was when they were alive. So can they adapt to the current situation, et cetera? Huh. All really important questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna mention some of the really great comments we've had so far. So uh, Kyoko Nagano says, Mitsume is my favorite shrine, super mm -hmm. power spot. Can do temple stay there as well. Great insight, thank you, Kyoko. And uh, Wendy says, is there a role for citizen scientists to help with the search? Maybe by setting up trail cameras, who can a person contact to get more involved? I know I've talked to Kyushu trail cam uh, enthusiasts who often do trail cams around mm -hmm. Kyushu, but in mm -hmm. Honshu, are there groups that people can contact? Well, one group obviously is uh, Hiroshi Yagi's organization, his, his nonprofit. Um, uh, Nihon Okami o Sagasukai is the Japanese title. Um, I'm not sure if he has a, a, a formal English title, um, but they have uh, uh, phone numbers and email addresses um, on their website. Um, there's also a group of uh, uh, Waseda University uh, old boys, OBs, <laughs> um, who, who also set up trail cameras, uh, mostly in the Okutama region. They work together, um, Yagi-san and the, uh, the Waseda people, and share information. Um, I also know, well, since I published the uh, the stories, um, I've gotten to know uh, various people through Instagram and other social uh, media platforms um, who sort of go out on their own and you know set up trail cameras here and there um, to sort of uh, see if they can capture these animals. Um, but most of these people are sort of doing it solo, not as an organization. Um, so various people are sort of actually interested in this in this phenomenon um, and working towards it in different degrees. Um, but I guess to start with, the best way would be to contact Yagi-san. However, he's um, in his 70s now, and uh, he's not as uh, physically uh, strong as he was, you know, back in the days. So he can't do like, you know, days and days of trekking. So what he does right now, he goes up once, once a week um, to sort of retrieve his trail camera data cards and replace them or change batteries if these uh, cameras run out of use. Um, and, but he's, he's, always, he's always up to sort of giving information in terms of advice on you know where to look for um, and things like that. So that could be a start, I think. 
Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to add any links below that aren't already there uh, mm -hmm. to different groups that people can get in touch with. Um, let's talk a little bit about the wolf as a protector. Mm -hmm. I, I found this so interesting. And these are stories I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk with Yukiaki Chishima, who's a, a priest at a mm -hmm. temple, and he has some interesting insights about the use of the wolf talisman. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that religious background with the wolf? Right. So, well, at least in terms of uh, Mitsumine, um, just a minute. Uh, you sound right. So right. I, I, mm -hmm. I have this quote uh, uh, just now from mm -hmm. Yukiaki Chisima, and he says in your article, according to lore, wolves announce the birth of a newborn by howls that could only be heard by an honest person. Mm -hmm. My ancestors are said to have heard such howls coming from Mount Wanukuda over yonder. That's amazing, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so there's all these ideas that the wolf can help uh, get out the evil fox spirit of a person. And the mm -hmm. wolf uh, is the protector, right? It's really interesting. Right, right. And and the question is, you know, when did, did this custom sort of begin? Um, there are various theories around it. In terms of uh, Mitsumine Shrine, the, the biggest wolf shrine um, in Chibu, um, according to their sort of history, uh, it was back in 1727 when a... Uh, a man called uh, a Nikko Hoin. Um, I would assume he's like a Shugenja, sort of a mountain aesthetic. He visited Mitsumine and uh, he took up residence. And one day when he was uh, out praying, uh, the premises of the temple was brimming with, you know, so many wolves. And he, 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 <laughs> he was taken aback and he started drawing pictures of these wolves and uh, made these sort of, uh, you know, something like this perhaps, and began distributing it to parishioners. And According to Laura, that became sort of uh, that triggered um, this sort of uh, the whole thing with the wolf talisman in the, in the region. What they would they would do is they would put it in front of their genkan, their front doors, and it's supposed to sort of uh, repel um, bad luck or uh, burglary or fire. And uh, even now, if you go to Chichibu, um, especially into the uh, the remote remoter mountain areas and when you visit villages, you would find these ofuda stuck on the uh, the genkan. And they all this, you know, since there are so many different shrines, you get all these different designs. So, for example, if you go to Ogano um, up in, uh, it's a town right next to Chichibu up in the highlands. Um, and if you go uh, to a, an area that's under the, uh, the precincts of uh, the Yuto Shrine, you would find a Yuto Shrine to Lisbon on the doors of these uh, people. It's, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> and it's just not, it's not only limited to Chichibu, actually. Um, wolf worship is uh, actually quite prevalent all over Honshu um, and elsewhere as well. So if you go to Tohoku, you would have their own sort of uh, Tohoku brand of wolf worship and you would find these ofudas. Um, or you could, or the Mitsumine Shrine, since it's so big and popular, you would find branches of Mitsumine all over the place, um, even in Tokyo. Um, so sort of tracing the, uh, the roots of wolf, wolf worship and sort of uh, tracing them to where it sort of landed elsewhere is sort of actually interesting. It's a, it's a different sort of, it's more like folklore, um, studies, but, uh, it's, it's really fascinating. That's yeah. really interesting. Uh, you also found, uh, haiku, right. uh, the monument in Higashi Yoshino village. Mm -hmm. uh, which has a haiku, haiku that says the wolf has perished, but its spirit lives on. This is beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Right. This, I mean, this is obviously on the presumption that the, the wolf has perished, right? <laughs> so some people would say, you know, it's not, it hasn't, it's not dead yet. But uh, anyway, this Higashi Yoshino is where uh, Malcolm Playfair, Playfair Anderson found the last wolf. So uh, they have a small bronze statue of the uh, the Japanese wolf there by the roadside, and right next to that is that particular haiku. Um, the inn he was staying in called Hogetsuro. It's no longer there, um, but you can still sort of get a feeling of the, the village, how it was back in the days, um, because a lot of the, uh, the the buildings that line the main street, they're all really old wooden Japanese houses. So, you know, I was I went there, visited there uh, last January, I think, and I was sort of imagining myself time tripping, uh, going back a century, and like, you know, I'm walking the street, and imagining, you know, play for Anderson sort of staying in Hogetsuro and the hunters bringing the wolf, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you can see from the uh, the landscape that, you know, this is, these are these are the locations where wolves would, would live. You know, you have a stream, so there's plenty of water for, for the animal to sort of take in. Um, People say they probably didn't 
they probably didn't live in areas with really high altitude, sort of mid altitude ranges um, with rivers um, and plenty of uh, deer and other sort of animals that they can prey on. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, Nara is another sort of center of, or the Key Peninsula actually is is, is a very another center of wolf worship or wolf sort of uh, religion um, in Japan. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a comment from Japan Trail Cam. Mm -hmm. uh, would love to be involved in the search somehow. Great. Yeah, they would be the best. Um, um, th these guys have trail cameras set up all over the place in Kyushu, I think, right? Um, and uh, the amazing footage. So I'm hoping one day, you know. They would they would actually capture that uh, uh, the animal and uh, that would be huge news. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. In fact, we we can use some of these old stories to maybe mm -hmm. uh, try to draw them out. There is some very unusual stories hidden inside, which is more connected to folklore. I think. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the okuri okami. Mm -hmm. the, the guiding or uh, like assisting, escorting wolf through the right. forest. I love that story. That's probably the most famous among uh, wolf related folklore, um, Okuri Okami. Um, so back in the days when there was no uh, electricity, um, if people would sort of visit, uh, uh, let's say a neighboring town and they were walking back home at night with their chochin lantern, I mean, everything's dark and they're walking in the forest and they would sense that something is coming behind them, a wolf perhaps. And they would, you know, obviously get, they would panic and get scared and they would, and the wolf um, by nature, they tend to stalk uh, either their preys or people who come into their territories. So the wolf would sort of like walk by, follow the uh, you know, the human being until they go home. And that, that, that I think that's sort of a, uh, behavior sort of led to the, uh, the legend of the Okuri Okami and various uh, uh, different versions uh, began popping up. One would say that, you know, uh, if you sort of tripped and fell while you're sort of uh, walking, the wolf will sort of jump on you. Another one is, uh, you know, back in the days, uh, people would have these fundoshi underwear, sort of like sort of these sashes wrapped around their, uh, so if you have, have like a really long fundoshi and have it sort of like quiver behind you, the wolf won't come at you. <laughs> and uh, Various, uh, you know, different sort of uh, versions of Okuri Okami episodes, um, and um, and they differ depending on where you go to Japan. And there Which, was mm -hmm. something about urine, and the attraction to salt, right? Right. So that there was, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned in the Key Peninsula, mm -hmm. um, they would have urine outside, which they would use for fertilizer on the farm, mm -hmm. and they noticed that the wolves were attracted to it. So then the idea of wolves being attracted to salt mm -hmm. came up and people said, if you were peeing on your way home and the wolf was attracted to it and followed you home, you could just put some salt in front of your door and mm -hmm. then it wouldn't come in. It would satisfy them and they would go away. Mm -hmm. that, that was so interesting. I'd never heard that yeah. before. Yeah, um, I think it's a very sort of... Uh, Japan and wolf specific uh, phenomenon um, that people used to believe in. I don't think it's sort of scientifically backed up in terms of whether wolves really like salt. Um, animals do go to mineral licks to sort of, uh, to, you know, take in their necessary nutrients from uh, these mineral licks, but would they actually go after salt? Um, I, I don't know. But apparently back in the days, people believed that. Um, plus, you know, salt um, is a very precious thing back in the days, especially in mountain communities, it's very hard to get by salt. Um, so giving this precious sort of uh, uh, thing to this animal, I think it also sort of showed, showed respect and sort of reflects how the, the wolf was sort of very high up in terms of uh, the animal hierarchy back then. So if you are worried about wolves being reintroduced, maybe just keep a little packet of salt on you at all times. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, exactly. You also talked about the artists who are trying to revive some of the old paintings. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. In Fukushima Prefecture, is it? That's correct. Um, the Yamatsumi Shrine in uh, Idate Village, which is in the nuclear no-go zone. Um, so this shrine had uh, a more than 200 the uh, wolf paintings on their ceiling. Um, but then it burned down. I think this was back in 2013 or so. But but luckily, um, before it burned down, um, they left, there's like a dis digital archive of each and every um, ceiling paintings. So what happened was uh, students from the University of uh, uh, Tokyo's um, 
Univer Tokyo University of Arts. So they, they embarked on this massive project where uh, students would sort of uh, repaint all the 200 uh, or so um, illustrations of these wolves and they sort of got it back up on top of Yamatsumi Shrine. I've never visited the shrine yet, actually. Um, that's one thing I need to really do. Um, and and I think not, not just the, the reproductions, but uh, there's painters out there who uh, sort of really make it a thing of painting Japanese wolves. Um, I think this strange attraction, I think, towards this particular animal. I read somewhere, and I haven't really verified this, but I heard that uh, the wolf is the animal uh, most depicted in literature across the world, um, not just in Japan. So I think, you know, it's just not limited to uh, the Japanese wolf, but uh, the wolves in general, there's this extremely strong sort of appeal um, in terms of uh, uh, their sort of mythical sort of statue, stature, I think. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And you also introduce, is it Michiko Hayashi, mm -hmm. who did a beautiful photo book, um, mm -hmm. which was very, very popular, very well received as well. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. Um, uh, great photographer. Um, she really helped me out in uh, sort of explaining um, a lot of the things to me. Um, he, she, uh, she, this is, I think this is handmade. She made this wooden box um, for her uh, uh, photography uh, book. It's a sort of a two book co book collection. It's a limited copy. I think there's only 100 around. So I don't actually own one. I borrowed one from Yagi-san to take a look. Um, it's magnificent. Um, and you see the th three circles in, in the box, the three circles. So I was wondering, you know, what does this mean? And it turns out um, if you go to Mitsumine Shrine and they have a, a, a little museum adjacent to the shrine, can see really old artifacts and uh, back in the days when they would store sort of wolf talismans and all and other wolf related things into these boxes, they would open these little air holes in the belief that the wolf will need to breathe so you need to give them you know sort of space to breathe so it's it's really interesting and that that's that's why there's three different little holes there so, wow that is really yeah. interesting so even for the talisman or the good luck charm mm -hmm. they would still put the air holes for the charm to breathe spiritually i guess That's at least so back in the days yes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. really interesting now i one story we haven't mentioned yet is about using the wolf skull mm -hmm. to repel the evil spirit of the fox from mm -hmm. people that was another idea right mm -hmm. yes so um, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the Kitsunetsuki phenomenon. I think it's uh, probably the most major, uh, what do you call, um, what's, the, what's the term for tsuki, uh, being possessed? Like, fox, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fox yeah. possession, yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, Kitsunetsuki or being fooled by the fox is, uh, I think, by far the most popular sort of uh, animal-related uh, supernatural folklore belief in Japan. Uh, you can find it everywhere in the world, I mean, in, in the area. Anyway, and Kitsunetsuki, what happens is you, uh, a person gets possessed by the fox, they sort of lose it. Um, maybe they get a high fever, they start blabbering things that you know nobody can understand. And um, it's that sort of a psychotic state that uh, people believed was caused by uh, fox spirits. Um, so what they did in some regions, um, or at least in Shichibu, and a few other regions at least, was uh, they would, some families would have been in possession of uh, Japanese wolf skulls. So they would visit these homes and ask ask the owner to uh, whether they can borrow the skull or sort of take a little sample of uh, of, of the skull to uh, sort of brew it into like a tea, so the, the person possessed can drink it and get rid of the uh, the fox possession. The idea was that the wolf was the the, the apex predator um, and uh, stronger than the fox. So if you can borrow the the wolf's power, then you can repel the fox spirit. <laughs> it's it's uh, you know it's interesting. Um, and yeah, I haven't actually been able to see this particular uh, uh, skull that uh, uh, Michiko Hayashi photographed, but um, um, its own, the owner is uh, uh, living in Shichibu still. So that's one of my things I'm going to do this year to visit him. Yeah, wonderful. Like really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and parts of Japanese culture and folklore and history that I, I'd never come across before. Um, so your uh, series, the deep dive series, is five chapters, and uh, it's available, I think, without the paywall on Japan Times as well. It's really mm -hmm. fascinating and interesting, and you talk to so many different experts and researchers and historians and 
and hunters. There's a real variety of, of information there. So I'd really encourage people to go and read through those stories. How do you feel about continuing your journey to research and continue with more chapters? Um, I, I think I've only begun really. Um, compared to you know other wolf researchers um, in Japan at least, um, my knowledge is just barely touching the, <laughs> the surface at this point. Um, my goal is to sort of uh, get a book out in English. Um, I'm always looking for publishers, but at this point um, the research continues. There's been some developments since the uh, the publication of the five part series already, um, and I think well, I can't really mention it now because it could be a potential story. But there's going to be another uh, sort of thing happening this year in terms of uh, the search, the actual search, uh, which will involve some really high tech DNA analysis. Um, so we'll see about that. Um, hopefully, maybe by the end of the year, um, if my editors allow, I can add a, a six sort of installment into the series. So right now it's just five and there's a little space there, right? <laughs> so perhaps uh, um, I can fill that spot while reporting on other uh, smaller details. But yeah, um, it's, I've just begun and it's just so deep. You know, it sort of connects to everything about Japan and you know, ecology and environment, history, uh, folklore, um, everything and, and how we perceive these animals or have perceived these animals. So I think it's a topic that, you know, it's sort of an introduction into everything about Japan um, and it's just fascinating. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've we've had uh, Japan Trail Cam has said, we want another five chapters and a <laughs> book would be great. <laughs> if you know of any uh, publishers, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, if you are connected to a publisher, we all want to read that book. Yeah. Uh, we Great question from Oscar Boyd. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining Oscar. It's wonderful to show your beautiful photos here. And uh, we enjoy your deep dive on Japan Times, your, your wonderful voice telling us stories and interviews. He says, uh, if wolves were introduced to Japan, how many would be needed for viable population? Are we talking 10, 100, 1,000? Great question. Um, probably not 1,000. That's probably too many. Um, but then if it's too few, then there's obviously the, uh, the chance of uh, incest. And, and that could sort of destroy the uh, uh, the packs. So um, I think what- I think one of your articles, you said at least 50 mm -hmm. to make sure that there was a help, healthy group that right. wouldn't have to interbreed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And where to sort of dispatch them, right? Um, I think that's another issue. Uh, I think Mariyama-san sort of hinted that, you know, perhaps best to start with uh, maybe a really remote sort of mountain area, uh, maybe in one of the islands, perhaps, uh, where they won't have, they won't be too close to human population. Um, and yeah, um, at least an, a healthy number sort of at least for, for at least a few packs, I think. Um, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> I think it really, we, we've never tried it yet. So it, it's, it's a really, uh, 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 people need to experiment if, if we're actually going to go for I, that. I think yeah. that could that could be a very viable solution, right? To try it on an island mm -hmm. so that you wouldn't uh, have a, a run across Japan where everybody's overwhelmed for if that would happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, really interesting. Uh, there was another writer we haven't mentioned yet that you talked to, Mieko Ogura. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So she she really she really uh, sort of focused on the uh, the wolf talisman. Um, she started off with uh, so she, she I think she, she comes from Kawasaki um, near Tokyo, and uh, right now it's a it's a it's a big city. But uh, back in the days there was a small uh, dozo kura uh, by her house, and she she found a, a wolf talisman one from one from here. This is uh, the uh, Musashi Mitake Shrine talisman posted on the dozo. And she took that and she began tracing um, where these talismans came from and sort of exploring, it traces back to a, a Musashi Mitake shrine, but she also trekked up into Chichibu and sort of uh, did like a comprehensive folkloric uh, sort of uh, nonfiction story about these talismans. Um, and it's a fascinating book. Um, I hear she's uh, she's working on a English translation of this actual particular book. So perhaps we'll uh, be able to read it um, sometime soon. Oh, that'd be great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, more information, the better. And it sounds like uh, through your research as well, uh, you've you've had such a variety of, of influences uh, in information. So I, I find that really interesting and fascinating. So you. do you personally think that the wolves are still around, even a hybrid version or some descendant of the Japanese wolf? Do you feel that it, it might still be around? 
I hope so. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, but in terms of uh, potential hybrids or uh, wolf um, dogs, wolves dogs with uh, Japanese wolf DNA, I think there's a very high chance that uh, those could exist. In terms of um, a purebred Japanese wolf uh, in the mountains of Japan, uh, we'll see about that. Um, I'm going to leave that part up to Hiroshi Yagi-san, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's always the possibility, and um, I think you know uh, once you stop believing. Um, that's that's it you know it's over i think you know what we can do is to not blindly believe in anything but just sort of uh, tackle the resources we have and you know try to learn as much as we can um listen to science and uh, just uh, keep moving on i think wow yeah and in terms of conservation do you feel that reintroducing wolves might be a good plan for a way forward i think i think um, as you sort of briefly mentioned, you know, experimenting in a uh, sort of closed setting w is is definitely, I think, something that, that people could uh, think about. Um, I know that, you know, if we suddenly sort of <laughs> release them in the mountains of Chichiba, for example, it's going to just, it's going to be front page news and people are going to scream. But uh, if it's like a close, closed setting, perhaps on an island or uh, maybe even in, in Hokkaido, perhaps, where there's a lot, a lot of land, I think, I think it's worth experimenting and see whether that actually works out in terms of Japan's uh, um, ecological sort of uh, environment, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's worth trying. Um, and there was one, yeah. one other interesting side note, which I think you touched on with Japan Kyo, mm -hmm. uh, Tony interview about how there's some resistance to introducing a North American wolf to take over from the role of the Japan wolf in kind of a nationalist kind right. of knee jerk reaction against something coming from the outside. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's not just uh, regarding the wolf, but uh, um, the, the, there's a certain term in Japan called gairaishu, right? Um, it's basically uh, uh, it's like gaijin for animals, <laughs> uh, outside species entering the Japanese uh, ecosystem and uh, we can have I mean, destroying um, um, <laughs> other animals, etc. It's I think there's an idea that you know, sort of importing uh, foreign animals into Japan could potentially be uh, uh, dangerous in terms of uh, maintaining uh, a Japanese ecosystem. Um, but there's a lot of but you know, what is the Japanese uh, ecosystem or environment, right? I mean, it's not, it's it is an island nation, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, we have. Uh, sort of uh, Japan only plants or animals. So it's sort of a, it's, it's mujun um, shiteru. It's, it's a concept that doesn't really, uh, I think, um, hold ground. But still, um, there are, there is strong resentment, I think, towards sort of importing foreign animals into Japan. And uh, that's going to be one major issue that uh, uh, organizations like the Japan Wolf Association needs to sort of uh, tackle. And they are sort of trying to sort of change that perception um, uh, through various uh, uh, projects and uh, speeches. But uh, yeah. That's, that's that's going to be a difficult one. I think that's a a good place to to end it as well, right? To refer people to the Japan Wolf Association and what they're trying to do with educating the public and creating kind of an open dialogue of transparency. And of course, we're not just going to introduce without you know talking to everybody and make sure that everybody is on the same page about acceptance and everything. But we are having major problems around Japan mm -hmm. with bears and boars and deer mm -hmm. and monkeys who maybe having a wolf around would help balance that overpopulation, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And vice versa, you know, if there is, if the Japanese wolf is still alive, or if there's a hybrid or, uh, you know, a descendant breed, um, I think modern uh, genomic science will allow uh, some kind of uh, way to sort of bring them back. That's another sort of idea. It's sort of uh, it's bordering uh, sci-fi stuff. But I think uh, the current technology available could potentially allow something like that as well. So there's various ways to go about it. But uh, the idea of you know bringing back the wolf, whether it be the Japanese wolf or foreign wolves, is uh, quite intriguing. Um, and I think something that's always uh, a possibility that people should keep in mind. There was one interesting story. Was it Yanai-san um, that you were talking about the brothers who trapped a wolf by accident, and then they were worried about being found out. Mm -hmm. So they destroyed the skeleton and buried it and wouldn't tell anyone where they buried it. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a chance that people who believe in the folklore or the, the deity part of the wolf might have found one or trapped one by accident. Mm -hmm. And then that story not getting out. Is that right? I think so. Um, there's definitely that possibility, especially, I mean, yeah. Um, I, I hear similar stories, at least until the, the Showa period. Um, right now we're in the Le Reba uh, era. Um, but uh, I think... It, at least, you know, in the Shiba region, there's still quite a strong respect towards the, the wolf. You know, they call it Doine Sama, um, and they're considered the uh, uh, deities. Um, so, yeah, um, there's always that chance. Oh, mm. That is our time. I think we could talk for hours and hours about this, Alex. Thank you so much for oh, joining. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to hear your insights. And I'm one of the group that would love to see more chapters and, thank in you. fact, a whole book. <laughs> uh, documenting all your amazing interviews and research. So I really hope that happens. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for the great questions and comments today. And uh, join us again tomorrow, 9 a.m. as we talk with Japan Inside Tours Japan, uh, Rob Moran talking about sustainable travel and hopefully the future of travel in Japan as it comes back maybe the end of this year maybe next year. We're not sure. Um, but he has some great insights. So join us again tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining today, Alex. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm an awful speaker, but I think you really helped me out in terms of flow. So I appreciate that. Oh, no, you, you're great. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. And uh, you would never know that you are a writer. You can do both. You can start your own podcast and tell <laughs> these stories as well. Oh, well we, have, we have Oscar Boyd covering that. So I think <laughs> It was a great collaboration, you guys working together as well. Yeah, sure, look sure. forward to more of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Okay.